My name is Jake. I'm the Education Program Manager here at the Waterfront Alliance. Uh, Waterfront Alliance is a U.S.-based nonprofit with more than 1,100 partners that focus on bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the New York metro area and beyond. Uh, for Climate Week this year, the Waterfront Alliance will be centering critical climate resilience issues facing New York through webinars, uh, roundtable discussions, art exhibits, and a coastal cleanup. Uh, we welcome you to visit our website to learn more about more of our events this week. Uh, today's webinar is titled Climate Education, Preparing Communities Through Youth. Uh, this panel brings together climate educators to discuss the current landscape of climate education, uh, the challenges in implementing the curriculum, and policy recommendations. Uh, it's my honor to introduce you to some of our panelists today. Uh, Alexa Schindel is an associate professor at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Schindel's right research lies on the crux of two of the most significant challenges in U.S. schooling, uh, the pressing need to increase the participation of young people in science from communities that have historically been underrepresented in STEM fields, and educating youth in a time of climate crisis. Uh, Dr. Schindel is a member of the Policy Committee of the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, uh, in which she has worked with youth, educators, and policymakers to forward climate education for all students in New York State. Uh, our next panelist is Kaylin Fox, the Education and Training Manager at the Office of Energy and Sustainability at New York City Public Schools. Uh, in this role, Kaylin facilitates New York's Climate Action Days, uh, develops and evaluates climate change education content, uh, and leads professional learning for K-12 educators citywide. Uh, she is also involved in planning and leading the NYC Public School Climate Education Institute and works collaboratively uh, with ed other educators to integrate climate content across various subjects and standards. Uh, next up, we have Michaela Labrioli, uh, the Director of Strategic Education Initiatives at the New York Hall of Silent Science. Um, in her role, she oversees NYSI's online programs uh, for educators and leads initiatives that focus on climate change education and engaging students in STEM. Uh, Michaela is known for her work in developing educational programs that incorporate systems thinking to address complex topics like climate change. Uh, our final panelist is Robert Makuske, uh, the Marine Affairs and Policy Advocacy Instructor, as well as the Sustainability Coordinator uh, at the New York Harbor School on Governor's Island. Uh, Rob leads the Marine Affairs Program, which integrates real-world examples, interactive activities, and sustainable concepts to educate students about the importance of marine and coastal environments. Uh, Rob is known for his hands-on teaching approach, encouraging students to apply critical thinking and problem-solving strategies to real-world challenges. Uh, I would now like to pass it to our moderator, Jesse Amon, who is the Manager of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs at EDF Renewables North America and Government Affairs, co-lead at Atlantic Shores Offshore Winds. Uh, Jesse, take it away. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm honored in my... Um, I'm honored. I'm a New York City public school alum, so it's really exciting to be part of this conversation. Um, and uh, Elaine Shores Offshore Wind um, is on the Corporate Council of the Waterfront Alliance. So again, thank you um, to the team for making this happen today. Super excited to get the conversation going. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, first question that we'd like to start with, um, could you share more a bit about the current landscape of climate education? Uh, maybe um, folks can describe um, the current state of climate education and in, in your respective fields. Um, I think, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started with Rob? Start with me, huh? Uh, okay. Uh, current state of climate education. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, really grateful to be here. Um, I, and with that said, you know, I'm grateful for the place I work at. I work at the New York Harbor School. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that I kind of work at a, the, my current, the current state of climate education looks very different than it does at my school uh, versus what it might look like elsewhere. Uh, I am very fortunate and privileged to work at a school that has a mission of kind of uh, humans impact on the environment with engaging students in critical um critical tasks of solving that, um, as well as a mission of stewardship, right? So, you know, my current state of climate education is sort of um, very privileged, right? I kind of am in a spot where I am allowed to um, engage students in curriculum that 
maybe elsewhere I might get a lot of pushback, right? Um, and, you know, for instance, just a, a lot of the projects, like, like right now we're engaged in a project um, where students will engage in the a stakeholder engagement process of marine sanctuary designation in the Hudson Canyon, right? So I have students working with commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, policymakers to sort of get an insight and to sort of critically look at that and comment on it. Right. I'm I'm given that flexibility to do that. Um, so somewhere I'll have an answer to the question, whereas I wish that uh many schools and many places throughout New York State and around the country would have the privilege that I have to sort of do whatever I want um around climate education to engage kids and critically solve on those emerging issues. Yeah. I work closely with Rob across this, across uh, the school year, and I appreciate you recognizing that you're kind of a jewel in the climate ed space, but it's really wonderful to have you to point to the success and the appetite that most students have for this kind of work. And I think that's something that our office has learned over this last year. We launched Climate Action Days in New York City for the first time uh, this past year because it was in Plan NYC. So we got some mayoral kind of nods there, which was helpful in getting stakeholders to take it more seriously or at least legitimize this idea of climate ed. Uh, and that was something that was really clear in this last year is that there is an appetite, not only for kiddos that wanna get involved in those types of things, but also for teachers, they wanna be trained on how to do it better. They wanna know how they can incorporate this thing into their curriculum across the board. And something we were really trying to emphasize with climate action days was that it was like a sustainable process that they were picking up from waste, right? So they're going to be composting for the whole year and they're going to keep that practice and improve that practice over the course of the year. So it's, we're in a really beautiful spot right now where we do, we're kind of getting met with the attention that we need to kind of highlight it and also the appetite of teachers and students to carry it out and keep it going and make it sustainable. Uh, so really looking forward to seeing what can come in this next year, because while there are a lot of challenges to teaching climate ed, we definitely have strong stakeholders in place to make it happen. So, and Rob is a shining star. So we are always going to point to Rob to show that there is efficacy in this work and there is success that can be, can be shown through his work and through work like teachers like him. Thank you both. Um, Michaela and Alexa, do you guys want to chime in? Yeah, I would love to. So um, I'm Michaela Brioli. It's great to see so many familiar names in the chat um, and great to be in conversation with my fellow panelists. Um, so I work at the New York Hall of Science, which is a hands-on science center in Queens. Um, so I'm coming from an informal education perspective. And I, I think we'll be talking a little later on about where are some opportunities for collaboration there. But when I look across the informal education space, I'm really optimistic because I feel like over the past several years, there's been a shift from sort of a more deficit focused, like, oh, if we can only teach people about greenhouse gases, this problem will be solved, to really trying to think about what are the assets and lived experiences that each individual learner is coming into a space with. Um, and I think starting from a person's real lived experience and recognizing that each learner, no matter how old or how young they are, has um, assets and ideas and questions to bring to the conversation is just a much more effective way to, to really tackle the challenges that we need to be tackling right now. And I think, you know, NISI does a great job of that, but I see so much of that happening both in formal and in informal settings that I'm optimistic that the momentum is moving um, away from outmoded methods of education to things that are, are really working for learners. Um, hi, everyone. Also really happy to be a part of this conversation. Um, and I want to focus a bit on this question from the teacher learning standpoint. And so with teacher learning, sort of focusing on both pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. And when we look um, across the U.S. as a whole, the landscape is really varied. And it's really dependent on the specific location that we're we're in, whether or not you have access to and are supported to engage in teacher learning around climate education. So I guess I would describe the field as emerging, um, where some states have really significant opportunities and supports and others um, less so, but um, more significant in particular locales. So for example, we know in New York City, 
Um, we have the um, teaching urban climate change my cred credential that launched in the spring um, that some of the participants have been a part of, and that's been really significant. Um, and I'm on the other end of the state, western end of New York, where um, we have at my university, for example, I offer one course per year in climate education, which is not enough for all of our um, pre-service teachers. So we're looking at how it is that we can integrate that across all teacher learning for our pre-service teachers, and then um, thinking about the opportunities and how we can expand upon them. Um, and then I also just wanna highlight, of course, we have teaching tools that have re recently launched with the New York Climate Education Hub. Um, so a lot of teachers and educators across the state have been involved in making that come to fruition. Um, so it's emerging. It's exciting. Uh, thank you for sharing all that. Um, I think it's a great start. Uh, next, uh, I'd love to pose a question on um, what are the biggest challenges you face when trying to implement climate education uh, programs? Uh, Kaylin, uh, do we want to start with you? Sure. Yeah. And I think Alexa really kind of brought it into perspective is that we have kind of a broad spectrum of teachers that are prepared to do this and teachers that are interested in doing this. But I think the main kind of vibe that we're getting and what the responses we're getting from teachers is the timing aspect and how they can fit it into their current curriculums while keeping their curriculum intact, right? For better or for worse, many teachers are teaching to a state test. So they have a lot of prescribed curriculum that they have to get through for them to prepare their students for those tests. So finding entry points into the spaces where climate makes sense we have tried to kind of knock down the silo of it's only a science problem, it's only a science subject. Um, and we've had a fair amount of success in integrating it into other class spaces and providing with that in mind, the timing aspect, we have worked really hard to get resources and the New York Subject to Climate Hub posting is so huge in helping teachers connect it to their own subject in a really simple way, um, in a well-vetted way. And I think that kind of handles that timing aspect, right? If I'm looking for a specific article or something, the subject to climate has vetted resources. So that's saving time that I don't have to go through to make sure that these are all credible sources, but just providing teachers entry points and resources to integrate it into their current curriculums rather than having them lay it on top of a curriculum, but kind of finding those entry points and, and kind of building in time with spaces that already exist. So we're not asking them to do more, we're just asking them to do this as well. Honing in on that a bit more, I, I'd like to pose the question of, you know, how do you deal or how do you address with resistance or skepticism from the various stakeholders you deal with, including, you know, maybe parents, educators, and or policymakers? It's a great question. We have a lot of successes that we can point to in these spaces so that we can show that it's working and that it is not adding a burden to things that's not affecting test scores so if that was the concern and the pushback like we cannot build in time for you we're not asking you to build in time it's within existing curriculum so that's helpful in being that we're not taking away from from what's already prescribed we have been met with a lot of positivity and i again i want to recognize that we're in new york city we're in a very special place we have a lot of support and not as much pushback as other parts of the state and the country. So definitely kind of taking that as a leadership role and saying like kind of paving the path of this is successful and we can make it work with the way that things are right now without disrupting things too much. We're disrupting them in a good way. Um, I'll also chime in. We really appreciate here in Western New York, <laughs> the leadership role that um, you folks have taken in terms of um, pushing things forward in spaces where you can push them forward. So one of the big challenges that we see across the state in different locales is that climate education has become seen as a politicized topic. And so it's considered to be taboo or too controversial to teach. And so some strategies that um, we have, that folks have kind of navigated to overcome this is to look at how it is that we can develop and align um, our ideological values or those of our communities with the goals of mitigating the climate crisis. So um, if the population is more conservative and yet values the environment for the ways that it helps people to engage in their occupations or activities such as hunting and fishing, 
then we can make connections to conserving through those values. So that's one of the ways that we're sort of navigating that. And then also, you know, potentially not engaging with the direct language that's seen as controversial. And I would build on that. And again, coming from an informal perspective, I think this is a role that informal spaces can play is sort of surfacing what are some of those values um, and how do we create opportunities for sense making built on those values. So again, you know, whether you're using the terminology climate change or just talking about the impact of heat days on your ability to enjoy a park or heat days on your energy bill, that becomes a different conversation. Um, and I think you know, working alongside formal schools, supporting educators through professional development, but also modeling that in in-school programs of how can those conversations happen? How can that sense-making around lived experiences happen um, in ways that feel like an honest conversation versus, you know, an educator trying to push an agenda? Um, I think another thing that is successful um, and that I'm seeing more of is emphasis on workforce development. So, you know, the solutions that we need to tackle these problems require innovative thinkers. Um, and so the more that we can tie back to sort of clear economic benefits and clear pathways to success, um, I think that helps take away some of the, the taboo. Um, it doesn't totally erase it, but I think that's one path forward um, in areas where it might be harder to have some of these conversations. Um, can I add on? Is that right? Um, yeah, I, it, actually, I was just talking about this with my students this morning, because they're going to start doing like participatory observations on waste, uh, in the cafeteria and how students sort their waste or not sort their waste, whatever. And we were talking about, um, participatory observation, but also like when going into these issues that are sometimes, you know, like we're dealing with people, like looking at it as like a, uh, identifying rather than comparing, right? Like we're not going in to compare who's better, who's worse and all this. Like we're just identifying with like a common value and that value is like protecting, it, it could be as simple as like having a clean lunchroom, right? Like it doesn't have to be a, at, a, at a surface level. It's just, it's not that um, taboo, right? It's just like, we want a clean space. So there's kind of like in the same way that I guess, I engage with my students on how to engage with their peers is like the way I model that behavior in dealing with like, you know, my administration, right? So like, for instance, I talk about workforce development, you know, I had the privilege of going to a USDA fellowship over the summer. And I guess I was, I don't know, not ignorant is a wrong word, but I was like, sort of, I forgot how much the USDA is present in my life, right? And they don't, they don't particularly they tackle controversial issues like climate change, but it's all from the idea of feeding a population and providing a workforce, right? So it's like not controversial at all. It's just like like having a vibrant economy and feeding a diverse population. And it's that simple, right? And that's the common value, you know, we could all share. So I've been, you know, when it comes to apprehension from, I guess, my administration level, I had us point to kind of the federal government and the USDA and sort of agencies that function under this like multidisciplinary sort of apolitical viewpoint. Right. Um, and we, right. Of course there's, we can debate about their policies, but whatever, but their mission is pretty universal. Right. So I, I've been using that a lot with approaching people that are, might be weary or apprehensive about engaging um with that and just kind of look to that as like a, a good model of um, why it's important. And it's not just this like taboo subject. I'm feeling very grateful that the New York youth have everyone on this call in leadership and leadership and influencing this because I think, yeah, very powerful to connect on a, on a people level for sure. And I think that's kind of the common theme that I'm hearing here. Um, so, uh, on that same note, um, would love to hear a bit more about how your lived experiences as well as cultural backgrounds impact the way young people navigate climate issues. Um, I know Rob was speaking a little bit about this. I don't know, Rob, if you want to jump back in or if anyone else has any other thoughts on or experiences I can speak to. 
you talk about my, my experience or just in general? I think general experiences, right? I'm sure you, you know, you're a teacher in New York City. I'm sure you deal with, you know, your own students, right? Like, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, yes. It, yeah, and I, I don't know, you know, somebody was um, sharing this earlier, just like this. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, I work at the Harbor School. Right. Some kids are scuba diving. Some kids are like on boats and my students are like sorting and cutting bags of like carrots open and making compost and like doing like an urban farm and like out in the cold, out in the rain, out in the dirt. Right. Like, um, So, I, you know, I, I think that. Yeah, it's like and I. You know, there's a lot of right. And, you know, I'm a white guy from Long Island. Right. So it's like you know, the historically, right. And, you know, people of color within the United States and worldwide have not had a good relationship with the content that I teach. Right. So it's been something that I've had to sort of wrestle with internally and learn from shared experiences of my students and from families and do a lot of education on myself uh, to probably teach it. Right. Uh, without being insensitive and, and sort of doing it correctly, right? So I think that, you know, it's, you know, it's learning from, you know, I always say this, right? Like, it's like, and I think this is something that I've learned, COVID really sort of changed this for me, is that there's a, te there was a, for a long time, there was a student teacher hierarchy that existed prior to COVID that I think COVID broke down because we had no other choice but to be, because we were like in each other's houses, right? Like, and like this crazy sort of forced collective trauma. And it really made me reflect on sort of like, I don't, you know, I like in a lot of these issues of climate injustice and food insecurity, some of my students know more about that than me. Right. So I have to be able to, I don't know, like I have to be able to, as an educator, um, having my historical background, I have to be willing to, be quiet and listen to my students' shared experiences in order in order to sensitively like being like and teach it in a sensitive manner and an inclusive manner. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna stop blabbing and let you share an experience. <laughs> I'd love to hop in and Rob, I love what you said about kind of humbling ourselves and kind of letting our students take the wheel because I think that is so true. And I think because of the circumstances that many of our students are in, they're already doing sustainability and they're already doing climate action in their homes and in their lives, but centering their experiences and their cultural backgrounds and hearing their stories, I think is one of the most powerful things that we can do. And it's one of, you know, the tools that we're given from all of these climate action ideas, right? Is the storytelling centering their stories and their actions and letting their voice be heard and seeing themselves in how the climate is changing, but also in the solutions that are needed that they are a part of. So yeah, I think centering their stories and having them bring in their own experiences and sharing those things and holding space for that and not centering the narrative around, you know, who's at fault and who needs to change what and all these individual things that need to change, but listening to each other and just bringing more seats to the table so that we can move as one, right? Because we have to take all of these different cultural diversity as a strength and help it create a solution that we can all be a part of. And I think that's that's kind of the main goal of public schools. And I'm sure that's a centerpiece in your class, Rob. If I can just add there, I just want to um, acknowledge and say thank you because you know we need we need teachers and leaders who empower students. And I can tell you, as someone who comes from a Latino immigrant family background immigrants have been innovative for a long time because they've had no other choice than to be innovative, right? So empowering students who come from those backgrounds where they're like, hey, like you come from this, right? Like you come from a space of innovation. You come from a, a, a space of like ancestors, whether it's like, you know, your ancestors are, you know, African-American in the United States or indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, like, this has been part of like who we are. And I say we as like immigrants, Latinos, people of color. And so I think having 
teachers who empower students to be themselves and bring that part of themselves to the classroom is so empower is so powerful. So thank you, um, thank you as a as a as a young woman of color from immigrant background who went to New York City Public Schools. Really commend you guys. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, love love policy conversations here. So um, what policy changes do you believe are necessary to improve climate education at the local, state, and national levels? Alexa, do you want to jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm um, here also representing the um, policy team of the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force. And um, we've been working really hard for several years at um, moving climate education forward. Um, and in the past year, um, introduced a climate bill statewide. So, um, I mean, to answer your, your overarching question, I believe we need a tidal wave of policy level support across states to support climate education since curricula and standards are um, de standards decision making occurs at the state level. And so um, when I say tidal wave, um, I mean that we have seen policies, um, including specific policy language, get introduced and passed um, from state to state. And so we need to um, pick up from that type of experience or that type of organizing and make that happen across various states. Um, and so um, currently, uh, in the last year, our, the, the legislative bill that um, youth and um, and educators across the state um, helped to co-write um, did not get passed, although we got support from over 60 um, assembly people and um, New York State senators, which was really exciting. Um, we're currently working with the New York um, State Education Department, and I said, to pursue a budget appropriation. So that's um, uh, essentially a budgetary bill and we're going to be moving that forward um, to move um, New York, I mean, climate education forward for all New York students. So um, I'm really hopeful that that uh, will continue to grow um, and you can get involved in that by going to our um, website, CRETF.org. Um, and I believe we will be going back to Albany this year to, um, to organize and to uh, promote the bill with a number of legislators. So. Um, we would love your um, continued involvement or new involvement if you're new to it as well. Thanks for sharing that. I know um, Waterfront Alliance just dropped the link in the chat. Um, I guess given you know, uh, the panelist group here, follow-up question on that would be, how can uh, educators and advocates work together to influence policy and secure funding for climate education initiatives. It's a tricky question, right? The funding question is always a tricky one, but I think the I think numbers really matter in this space, right? And the more people you have signing on to something and the more teachers you have supporting it, and particularly teacher voices are really powerful in education spaces, but more than teachers, students and their families um, I personally feel like their voices are the strongest in spaces like these because they should be the ones dictating what the education standards look like. So empowering those folks. And Alexa, thank you so much for the work that you've done this last year. We had a couple of kiddos join you in Albany and it was really formative for them. So they, it's meaningful and it's powerful. And I think just getting those numbers up because that's the, you know, voices in the chorus kind of vibe, like the more voices you have singing the same song, the stronger it is. So we just got to get that message out there and get more folks on board. So that speaking to all of you here, so get on board, join, join us. Yeah, go up to Albany and cause some good, good trouble out there. We love that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, you know, this is interesting, you know, both like at, at a micro level policy within the school and like at a larger level, you know, I've seen like a, like this train, like the sustainability train is like full force, right? It's been like, it's been moving, right? We have the climate action days, right? Composting is citywide. I'm using that example, but like in other ways, like, you know, you've seen an increase of nonprofits, like Sunwork, Solar One, like this, like it, these things are like moving very quickly. Um, and I think that, you know, for every, you know, like this year at a small level at school, like we were faced with, 
uh, budgetary constraints and they want to immediately like some generally sustainability programs are like the first to go. Right. Um, and I was like, you know, just be, being sort of um, like, we can't go backwards, right? Like we don't have to expand, but you can't take away. Right. So I think like having that kind of mindset when it comes to this sort of climate education and climate initiatives and looking for money, it's like the train is like moving, right. And it's moving at a moderate pace. Right. And we can't like slow it down. Right. We just have to keep like, keep going, going and like keeping that message, both at like a small level and a larger level. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of money out there, right. To look, I know I write a lot of, seek a lot of grants every year um, for a variety of different sources to be able to do what I do. Um, and it's just like that, uh, trying to get the ones in power with the political will, right? So like what like Kim was saying, like sharing that success, right? And not just my success, like the kids are engaged and having success too. Um, so. And this makes me think about two things. So one is like just the power of storytelling. And so again, depending on who the funder is, the story that's going to resonate with them is slightly different, but having that authentic story and sort of, you know, building capacity for youth and for families and for communities and schools to be able to tell their authentic story in a way that can resonate with different funders, I think is really powerful. And I see that happening in, in classrooms across the city is this emphasis on like, how do you talk about what's important to you? How do you share that with others? But the other thing this has me thinking about too is like the way we talk about civics. Um, and there are so many great civics resources out there. Um, but a lot of times when we talk about civics, it's like you you will do civics later when you can vote. But what does that mean for you as an elementary school student? What does that mean for you as a middle school student? Um, and I think some of what we've talked about is civics, you know, being able to go up to Albany. You don't have to wait to do that. And your voice still matters. You are still important. You're a stakeholder. You're a constituent. Um, but also, I think a huge part of civics is what happens when that bill doesn't pass this year? And how do you keep that momentum going? And how do we model that? for youth because that is, you know, something that they're going to be facing. And again, I see so much to be optimistic about there with kids being resilient when, you know, maybe they get in front of an elected official and it doesn't go the way they want, they're not giving up, you know, that lights that fire. And so I think there's a lot um, to be said around like, how do we talk about civics in a different way? How do we support civics in a slightly different way to kind of keep that momentum going that you were talking about, Rob, of like, we're not going back. Um, and how do we just keep pushing forward a little bit? I'll just follow up on that, that um, schools are like the foundational space where we can learn to become civic actors or democratic citizens. And yet it's a space that we too often abdicate um, and so, and it's not often thought of as like schools being a space where we learn how to participate in democracy. So I think that's a really important point. And then I also want to share that when we went to lobby in Albany last year, by and large, they did not like senators and folks did not want to listen to the adults. They were like, thank you for sharing that. Now let's go to the students. I want to hear from you. So it, it was a really powerful experience for them um, all, and really for all of us, I think um, for, for many of us involved in it, it was our first time going to lobby. So a really huge aspect of participating in um, the civics of our society. I love the theme of we're not going back. That's, love that. <laughs> um, Let's see, uh, okay, moving on to the theme on collaboration. So um, the question here is how important is collaboration between schools, community and culture organizations, excuse me, and policymakers in advancing climate education? So I would love to, to jump in as like an informal voice. My short answer is, very important. Um, but I think we've already heard about, you know, the constraints that formal schools are working under, the constraints that an individual teacher might be working under. Um, and at the same time, we also, you know, research has shown that science learning over the course of someone's lifetime, only a small percentage of that is happening in a school. Um, and so I, 
informal institutions, and that can be anywhere that you're learning. That can be going to a museum, but it could also just be playing in a park, um, have such an important role in supporting formal schools, but also um, going beyond in, in different ways. Um, and so a thing that I'm really interested in is how do you create those sustained pathways? So I think a lot of students, classrooms, they'll go to a museum for a field trip, but that might be once. Um, and so how do we create opportunities where teachers really feel supported by informal learning institutions that are around them? And that could be an educator being able to get some professional development that maybe, you know, isn't offered by the district. Um, that could be a series of field trips that kids can go on so that they're building understanding over time. That could be programs where schools partner with out of school time institutions that allow caregivers to go because we talked a little bit about um, Alexa I think your point about elected officials not really wanting to hear adults we see that all the time of like when you have multi generational learning happening. Things become more solutions focused things become more optimistic when you have adults learning next to kids, those are all things that informals. Um, make possible that are a little bit harder to do in a formal school setting, and so I. You know, my dream is that we're not seeing informals as just that field trip, but that they are key partners working side by side with formal schools to sort of complement and amplify. Um, but that, again, takes money, that takes policy shifts, that takes intentionality. Um, and so, again, how are we creating those pathways? And I do want to call out the Climate Action Days as like a great step towards that. Because that lets, you know, that encourages schools to think about who is that informal partner that can help me. Um, and the Office of Energy and Sustainability provides those seed grants of like, I'm a school, I want to work with an informal institution. Here's some funding to support that. Here's some structure to support that. And I've seen how, you know, that initial interaction can then lead to these bigger partnerships. So it's happening here or there. Um, so how do we make that happen on a bigger scale? Yeah, I agree 100%. I think one of the big issue, not issues, I think one of the big features of collaboration is awareness. Like if teachers don't know that all these not informal education spaces exist, then they can't utilize them, right? So this last year, along with Climate Action Days, we were able to host a Climate Institute during February. We trained 500 teachers in climate action and climate change education. So we're kind of ticking that box of that teachers feel unprepared to teach things like this, but also bridging that gap between formal education and informal education and what they have to offer, right? Because you can be extremely specialized in an informal way because you're not trying to like contort yourself to fix fit a curriculum but you can also help teachers in finding those entry points. So the awareness is one big feature that we're trying to bring to teachers is that there are so many partners that want to help. There are so many partners available. We offer the grant and thank you for mentioning that it launches next week. Um, but also just connecting teachers and empowering them to, to make those and relationships and sustain them independently of us eventually, right? We are okay with being the scaffold right now, but we eventually want them to be able to seek those things out and maintain those relationships locally as well, right? Because the community is such an underutilized aspect of climate ed in general, right? This is a problem that we're all facing. It's a crisis that we're all enduring. So having local people in your community working together with your school organization, with those informal education organizations is really powerful. That's a big goal of ours this year is how, how do we engage a community and kind of ignite that collaboration within those spaces also. So for sure, very important. We've had a lot of success. The Climate Institute was extremely successful. I think part of the reason we were able to do that in a successful way is because we were paying teachers for their time. So we were kind of saying, this is a value that we have. This is really important to us to respect your time and bring you this, this information. So doing it again this year. So if you are a cultural institution, any kind of institution, and you want to be a part of it, please reach out. But it is successful. There are people that want to get involved and we just have to help make those connections clear and kind of clear the pathway to make them as, as frictionless as possible. Those are all really great points. And um, I just want to chime in and add that when we have these types of collaborations between multiple different types of organizations, it provides us with an opportunity to um, potentially, uh, I think, disrupt some of the oppressive relationships that are uh, often occur. So for example, universities are 
unfortunately very well known for engaging in research on communities or research that negatively affects um, marginalized communities. And so it's important that we are sort of looking at the ways that informal and um, formal collaborations between multiple types of institutions can then disrupt some of those practices. So an example of that is um, here in Buffalo, a number of organizations and the university have both received grants to put in um, air monitoring um, uh, devices all across the east side of Buffalo, which is a historically marginalized community. It's the, um, we have a highly segregated um, city and it, this is historically the black neighborhood. And so it's been really important to develop relationships and dialogues across the different organizations and communities um, so that learning can occur around um, the air monitoring. And so we're not like just doing this extractive type of research and um, instead like looking at this as a space where many people can learn and think about um, uh, the air quality as an environmental justice issue, so. I just wanted to highlight that someone dropped in the chat a resource for teachers um, on um, clean energy for educator events that NYSERDA is, is sponsoring. Um, so that's really great. Thank you. Um, and uh, no, thank you all for sharing um, like solid examples uh, and exciting to hear about that grant, Kaylin, that's coming out. So hopefully next webinar we'll have some more uh, successful partnership examples from that. Um, so we are uh, on our last question of the panel, and I do see that there are questions in the Q&A, so please continue to drop those questions in there. We can get to at the end of the of the panel discussion here. Um, so last question is um, for everyone, of course, uh, what are some key considerations for the future of, of climate education? And how can we ensure that climate education remains adaptive and responsive to the evolving challenges of, of climate change? Kaylin, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I think we have been kind of building towards this, this the whole panel in considering communities, considering um, cultural diversity and kind of these home stories that we are bringing to the forefront. I think these are challenging times, right? We have really, we're in a crisis. And I think kiddos are really good at like vibing a situation. So if we're constantly talking about how we're in a crisis and if we don't act now, like that's, bad things are gonna happen and the climate's gonna collapse and your grandchildren and all these things. I think we don't wanna scare anybody into apathy, right? We want them to feel empowered. We don't want them to feel afraid. And I think always kind of when we're discussing these types of things, keeping it action centered and keeping that collaboration at the forefront in that you know, when we're working together, we can solve big problems. And just keeping that action centered. I, I love what Rob said about not going back. And I'm glad that you emphasize that because I think that's so true. And I think we are in this kind of key moment where we have the momentum and we have the attention. And now we are missing that key component of the money and the policy. So if we have all of these things driving towards that same goal with those action centered ideas, then we can definitely make make a lot of moves. But we don't, we don't want to scare anybody into in action and giving them tools. And I love that we have climate action days because kids can get as involved or as not involved as they want. But what we said at the top is true too, right? There is a lot of appetite for, for doing these kinds of things and, and to participating in these things so that they don't feel like they're part of the problem and not the solution. So just giving entry points to students, but also families uh, another big goal of our office this year is bringing families in to try to empower them as well. So action center actions would be my my short answer. Uh, yeah, I hope I didn't lose my train of thought. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, I I really like what was just said about the hope, right? You know, sometimes... I know early on in teaching the course that I teach seven, eight years now or whatever it is, I remember I had gotten feedback from a partner from a, from a university. They're like, oh, like you're being too doom and gloomy. 
Like you gotta change your perspective. You have to you know, like you're like no, no, right? You're being too negative. Um, and it was really an eye opener, right, to think about that, right? Like if I'm constantly teaching that we're in like this existential crisis, like you know, just the kids and be like, did what the like, why are we even in this class then, right? Like, why? Like, what's the point, right? So I think, you know, offering, you know, this goes back to the previous question as well as like something talking about like teachers getting inspired and this, you know, this, you know, climate education train moving, you know, I think like as is like as internally alarmed as I feel in this situation, like having small successes and like small progress, um, both me in a reevaluation of my teaching front, as well as like giving the kids like small success in this right um and sort of is very helpful um and sort of you know carrying on that hope and yeah i think that's all i got i i know i had something else to say but uh i forgot so <laughs> i'm gonna build on that but if you remember just interrupt me um but i feel like you know when you're talking about small successes, a thing that comes up for me is scoping. And I feel like when you have a problem that is so big, it can feel like we're not doing enough or the project needs to be bigger or how, you know, how is it having more of an impact? But I think really focusing in on hyper, hyper local examples. And I think in New York City, we see this of like one block to the next, you can have dramatically different experiences of flooding, of heat. Um, and even within a classroom, like it's okay to focus in on that. And I think a big part of that is also the empathy building that we've been talking about, the perspective taking, being able to show up as your authentic self and have real conversations. And so I think, again, continuing to focus on hyperlocal as we move into the future is going to let us have that more global impact that we're looking for, but in a way that is sustainable, that we're not burning out, um, and that we can actually sort of move the needle. I think I remembered. You made me remember. Uh, yeah, uh, and this may go to all of our questions. I think in framing all this, particularly, right, like I never, with that shift of like teaching more hopeful, I never, like I don't, this isn't an environmental or ecological issue, right? It's an economic progress issue, a social equity issue, and an environmental issue. So I always like, whenever I talk to the kids or anybody or, even think of it for myself, right? I always think of it in that balance, right? Sustainability is doing all those three things like the best we can. Um, and I think, you know, often at times it's like, I wouldn't, this is being recorded so my students will hear me. I often trick them, right? Into like learning the the thing that I want them to learn, right? Because you have to make it, and tricking them is strong, but like, that cultural relevancy or local relevancy, like you were saying, is what tricks them into learning the larger concern without being daunted with that larger problem, right? So often at times I find myself discussing um, these things as social issues, as well as economic issues, because we could, we could all relate to that, right? You know what I mean? Um, and that's sort of what I found is helpful to like size it like that. So um, I was also just going to focus on hope and action. So totally agree and with and support everything y'all have said. The only two things I'll add is um, one from the research lens in terms of thinking about um, student learning that we understand and know that students sense making when they can understand and make sense of something in that hyper localized um, space and place, they can then extract um, into larger spheres. And so understanding global climate be really does begin with the local. Um, and, oh, I think I forgot my, oh, yes, my second point is, is, um, is to also think about um, the way that we're connecting to the broader policy structure, because the focus on um, individualized actions is both not worthwhile from a, a global change making standpoint and also very demoralizing. So we also want to focus on the ways that we're making those connections with our young students, um, connecting them to like, okay, we did this cleanup in our yard. Great. Now let's all, um, if you have the ability to sign this petition that is sending a message to our local government or our state government, things like that. 
So just building in those connections is really important. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, we have a lot of questions and very awesome questions that I'm going to um, kick off with shortly. I just want to chime in and just briefly um, say that I think on the um, technology side of things, I think as a as someone who works for a developer who develops clean energy projects, not only in New York, but in the tri state area in the country, um, I think there's a responsibility also on those developers coming into communities to also provide those educational resources. Um, and I can tell you that Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind uh, um, partners with um, organizations like Offshore um, for Kids, where they show the kids um, how the wind turbines work and it's like a whole day they're on the water and you know they're learning how it works and it's really cool so I think you know I think there's also that responsibility on the private sector to um, you know to bring also the educational resources to the communities where are bringing projects in so um, thank you everyone um, so I'm gonna get started I know we only have a couple minutes left on this um, exciting conversation so I'll start with the first question I have here is um, says teachers success is usually measured by how well students do on state tests. Do we have studies or case studies showing how real world applications of climate change education can drive student engagement or student performance? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Um, oh, go ahead. No, all I was going to say is I mean, more teachers are teaching it, right? So I think it's like the proof is in that, right? I think that a lot of educators across everywhere are finding out that, you know, this engaging in students in this type of learning works, right? As far as like data level, I think someone else is going to answer that. But I just think, but if we look at the way teachers are trending and engaging students in real life, and even in math and science, right? It doesn't even have to be climate education, just in general, Teachers are engaging kids in problems to solve, to learn content and gain skills. That's just like good teaching. So I think this, that's like the proof we're all moving that way, I think. From the data standpoint, we do not. For New York City Public Schools, there's not specific data that's around engagement on climate change. But as Rob is saying, we do have an increased participation in a lot of different areas. Our Youth Leadership Council has in the last year been trending up in terms of an application. So there is a lot of, again, to bring it back to the appetite, but I'm sure that there are some wheels in motion to get some data behind climate change and the effect it has on student engagement, um, but not any anything that I can share right now. Um, I, I don't know of any correlation studies either. And I mean, I think it would be difficult to sort of track that data wise because of correlation. That's difficult to say what's causation versus correlation. Um, and also just highlighting the fact that it is still such an emerging field. And it's almost like, I think education um, and educators and teachers have sort of led the way and research is catching up um, in terms of like trying to um, analyze and figure out what are the best practices. So we're, we're, we've got a long ways to go. Thank you. Um, on that similar um, topic, um, someone in the chat asked, in the formal New York City public schools curriculum, how much, how much and how often are climate issues taught in the school year? Well, I mean, I could answer it from my New York City. So I think there, and there's a lot of these. And so like I teach a dedicated program to natural resource and management in the agricultural food and natural resources sector. So it's a career technical program. So climate education is like baked in from its inception, right? So the whole, so there's programs all across the state, even, you know, and in the varying degree in which they do it, like a lot of food, natural resource, agricultural programs, I mean, by default, they have to talk about it, right? Because it produces, it affects food production, and the level of how they engage it is there like a how I guess cataclysmic climate change is and now they kind of look at it uh, would be varying different. But 
within the career technical world, certain clusters have it like baked in, in, in my experience and opinion. Let's see, I know, I, fortunately we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions, but um, another question that I have here in front of me is, what is an interesting school or a community project you've seen or have been involved with that has gotten students slash the youth most engaged and excited? Self-promotion here at Climate Action Days were really well participated in and attended. We had, of 1,800 schools in New York City, we had 1,100 participate. So for a first year's initiative, that was really huge to have even schools participating in one day. Um, but I think composting has been a really helpful way to kind of like break open into schools because kiddos are participating in that. Um, at the elementary level, they have every lunch in school. So they are doing it on a frequent basis. So waste audits are particularly popular with, with the young ones. Um, I'm going to ask you to circle back to our sustainability hub because we are going to be posting climate action day successes. So you can kind of comb through there and see what the level of participation schools had, but it has been really impressive and really wonderful to see them get so excited about these things. So I can't pinpoint one thing, but I will say the composting has had um, a, a a large amount of success considering the size of the system that we're trying to get to do it, so. And on the informal formal partnership side, um, NYSAI has had youth from local schools that, you know, we've worked with the schools to bring in as part of an after school program to co-design exhibits with our exhibits team, um, telling their stories about resilience and sustainability and climate change in their neighborhoods. And I think in general, projects that allow youth to sort of share their stories with others and kind of use their experience as teaching tools for others has always um, had high engagement. Go ahead, Alexa. I'll also add um, just on the hyper-local side as the young people that I've worked with have learned within their environments, it's just been extremely impactful to them um, and whether that's one time or many times, um, I, I found that in my research, those who engaged in place-based learning in the outdoors once with their, their teacher, they had similar results um, in terms of their, their learning and the impact on their learning. So um, as one example, one of the students in my one of my research projects um, talked about how the, the difference that he saw when he began to understand that the local um, in, uh, native trees supported that much many that many more insects in terms of their habitat and what they could eat. And he shared something like um, how he used to see something and think green was just good. So you plant something, anything, it doesn't matter. It's green, it's good. And now he sees that there's a different, a qualitatively different value to what he plants. Uh, yeah, I'll share one quick one because I know we're running out of time. Um, every year I love um, taking, my students and I go to Mulch Fest, uh, which is in New York City, where you bring your Christmas tree to the park and they chop it up and then you care for street trees in New York City parks um, and you help kind of revitalize and beautify a neighborhood and help clean it up and work with community leaders. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, like was just said by Alexa, you know, getting kids out of the classroom and into the, like, into the public, into the communities doing those things. Um, uh, you know, it's like I said earlier, it's like tricking them into this like grand learning of all these things, right? Um, so that's a really fun activity if your community has um, a mulch fest, right? Um, and even if you even, like I don't particularly like Christmas, but I like bringing a Christmas tree and getting it chopped up. So uh, that's it. Well, thank you everyone um, for your participation today um, and for your insights and sharing your experiences. And I know there were a lot more questions in the chat, sorry we couldn't get to it, but please go follow the Waterfront Alliance and the folks on here who plugged in their, their projects and their organizations. Um, so thank you for joining today. Have a great rest of the week and happy climate week. Bye everyone.